everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Jessica Pocket. Um, you can take a look in the Slack um, description for just details of my my bio. But I live in Chicagoland, and I'm I'm new to the the, the Panda Group, but not new to um, advocacy and um, writing about data and things that went on in the during the uh, COVID or alleged, I should say, a global global pandemic. Um, ever since I came back. Uh, from my Twitter ban, uh, I've been very, very focused on just a few topics um, from January onward or, or so. And one of those has been um, New York City and the mass casualty event that occurred there in 2020. I've long been interested in it in 2020. Todd Kenyon probably remembers where I was like, hey, everyone, what happened in New York City? Can we talk? Can we talk about this? Um, and people would say, well, ventilators or nursing home policy, but that never really seemed to fully explain things for me. And I was never really convinced or intellectually satisfied, and I'm still not, that uh, there was sudden spread of a novel respiratory pathogen that that killed you know, 20,000 people in 11 weeks in, in New York. So I've spent a lot of my, my personal time, nobody's funding this work, this is just me and my um, my my hobby. Um, I spent a lot of time gathering data, getting data through public records requests and uh, directly from from researchers. And so this is uh, some of that work is is going to be in here. Um, and I'll if if you have a really burning question while I'm sort of more formally presenting, please just interject. I'm I'm all about. I grew up in a family of interjectors. Some people will call us interrupters, but it's it's inter interjectors. So I'm more than more than comfortable with with that. I want to start by kind of giving you a metaphor. If you've ever read the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, you know that the basic premise is you look at outliers, you look at extremes, extreme stories of success in in his book, and you say, what is it? that makes this outlier successful and what could we learn from it? And I think that's true with, with New York, except I would call it a, a story of systemic failure. <laughs> but I think that it's an exception in such a huge regard that we can look at it and say, okay, does the exception prove the rules? And so I believe that this in-depth study of what occurred there generates some rules that are applicable to the entire pandemic. So that's why, or one reason why my focus has been on a very specific time period and sequence of, of events. This morning, my questions that I framed the presentation with, um, well, well, first, just a statement that I, I, hope, I hope we can all agree that New York City experienced an unprecedented near peerless mass casualty event in, in that spring, and, and what the heck Happened. This has been a burning question for me for a long, long time. So I'm going to present aspects of just the scale of the event to give to give us all a sense of, of scale. Um, some elements about who died, although I have to tell you, this is actually this is such a burning question for me. Who the heck were these people? Not just gender and and age and uh, cultural background or racial background, yes, but who were these people? Where did they die? How did they get to the hospital? For example, if they if they died died in the hospital, place of death data is very thorough in in the United States, and it's been often neglected, I think, by re, by researchers and uh, and the CDC, uh, which is very interesting to me. I'll also show you some things around this question of uh, where was COVID <clears throat> before and leading up to this mass ca mass casualty event. Was it silently seeding? Like, how how can we see it? Where does it show up in in data? Are there are there some clues? And then I'll also touch on the role of maybe not touch on it. Maybe this is just enveloping the whole thing. But what role did politics and protocols and policies policies play? Um, and who cares? Like, why does it matter? I get that a lot from my my colleagues, or some of them are kind of former former colleagues now, but on. Twitter, like, why do you care about this? Who, who why, why are we looking back on this? I get that from New Yorkers a, a lot. Like, so, so what? You know, yes, people die. The virus was bad. We could have done better. Um, so I, I'll address that toward the end. Um, 
this group is really smart. I'm, I'm presenting to a, a group of people that are, are far beyond my expertise in, in pretty much every arena, but I just want to let you know that this is a little graph heavy, uh, the content that I'm going to present, but because this was a mass casualty event and an, an incident, time series data especially has been so critical to me um, and, and I think it's critical to any examination of looking at what happened in, in New York, New York City. This is my working hypothesis, which, you know, it's a hypothesis that I, I know some of you share too, just in general, about what happened with the global pandemic. But I, I'm operating more or less from the null, not because the null necessarily is 100% true. In, in other words, null hypothesis, sudden spread of a, of a, novel respiratory pathogen is not responsible for any of the, the, the deaths in excess deaths in, in 2020. That, that may or may not be the case in the final analysis, but I think we get closer to the truth by operating from the null than operating from the assumption that it was mostly, mostly COVID. And I hope to be able to show you today or just a glimpse of, of the reasons why I believe, look, 27,000 people, extra people died in 11 weeks. It's astounding. It's, it, it's incredible. But I think that enough happened from the human intervention side that does explain, that can explain the casualties that occurred. Does that mean that I don't think that there's a virus? No. Um, I, I don't really care if there's a virus <laughs> in, 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 in some ways. I'm sort of less concerned with that than I am the investigation of the non, what I would call non-natural forces that were acting upon a city of 8.8 .8 million people. So let's look uh, just briefly at the, the scale of the event. Again, I know this group is aware of, of some of these details already, but it, it's always interesting to, to me to, to frame for, for people. I did this a few months ago on, on Twitter, just to try to keep getting at the scale of the event, because I feel like a lot of people don't understand. So back in February, I said on Twitter, hey, say there's a city that normally has 4,000 deaths or so in a month. If that number jumped to 25,000, what would you think had happened there? The responses were pretty funny. Some people were like climate change, you know, being being pretty, pretty funny. But um, other people said vaccine, which was an interesting response response to me as well. Um, but, and other people were like, where, where did that happen? Did that happen? And yes, it, it, it did happen. Um, to quote T.S. Eliot, a April was the cruelest month in, in New York City um, in a very, very, very long time. The scale there is just incredible. I think people believe, okay, 8.8 .8 million people live in New York City. So, all right, that 27,000 extra people in 11 weeks isn't really that much. It is It is a lot. It, it's a city that experiences 100 and I think 150 or so deaths a, a day, give or take, about 4,500, you know, in, in an average month. And they had an astounding number of bodies, uh, no disrespect to the, the dead, but astounding number of casualties occurred. I do assume that those casualties did occur. People ask me, do you think it's fraud? Do you think they made stuff up? Anything is possible, but I do operate from the assumption that those are those are actual people who 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 died. 450% increase. Um, pretty much unmatched around the world at that time, maybe with the exception of, of Bergamo. Jonathan Engler maybe could speak to that better than I could. I was able to obtain a daily death data. I tend to focus a lot on all-cause mortality, so I'm a little like Denis Raincourt in that regard. Um, dead is dead, right? And you know, un unless we're talking about excess mortality, it doesn't necessarily matter what what people die of when we're talking like a, a natural natural death. So um, if we we take a look at the daily data, you can see that I have a red bar there. It's not, it's not anything statistical, you know, true, true confession there, but I'm just showing where exactly the mortality kind of starts to move. And that's on March, March 18th, 2020. But it's astounding to me that we don't have anything going on in all-cause mortality leading up to mid-March. Mid 
And then perhaps even more striking is that all-cause mortality, daily all-cause mortality and, and weekly and monthly dropped like a rock. It actually went below baseline and doesn't rise again until December, late December, which is uh, during the advent of the, the mass vaccination campaign. I think that's, in, that's incredible. Very, very few places around the world, or excuse me, in, in the United States looked exactly like this. Um, New Orleans actually comes, comes pretty close in so far as the drama of just the rise and then the fall and then doesn't come back up until late, late December. So it's a, a lot of people in a very, very short time. The prevailing narrative that I would say most New Yorkers still believe, most Americans still believe, is that the virus hit New York harder and then New yeah. York defeated the virus, right? Right? Like this yeah. is this, and there couldn't be a more American <laughs> narrative than, than that, right? Um, this was basically the narrative of Andrew Cuomo's book, fascinating read, by the way, if you don't mind spending the five dollars. Um, it, it, it's fascinating. And, and that was Trump's narrative, too, uh, about it. That's New Yorkers narrative. Um, the virus hit harder, but New York defeated it. New York hospitals figured out what to do with the virus and showed the rest of the world. And then the rest of the world wanted to avoid being New York. And thank you, New York, for, for doing this for, for us. Um, was it Todd that said yes? I, I didn't hear who said yes there, but um, yeah, that's that's de definitely the, the the case. I have a I have a quick question, Doc. Uh, do you have this time scale showing when they uh, first did the massive lockdown of that's some part of the city? Right, because I was I was in New York when oh, they awesome. said, oh my, that's awesome. "Oh my God, we, we got to stop right now." This <laughs> this part of the locale has been blocked off. We got guards at, at the gate, that, that kind of crap. I don't know. Oh, right. Know. Yeah, in, okay, um, yeah. In New Rochelle, right? The exactly. So I'm like, you know, came in and, oh, my, yeah. oh my Lord, we got to get home. That I, I was, I was kind of struck by the, by the, by, by the fear. I almost kind of got uh, bought into it. I'm like, oh my God, well, like, I got to get the train like right now. Jesus. Yeah. You know, so. yeah and, and to your, to your point, and I'll come back to this too. And I live in Chicago land. I used to live in, in the city in Chicago. I was in Cook County when this all went down. But I know New York very well. My husband's there all the time. I, I used to go all the time too. You know, there people, a lot of people don't understand, like there's a, there's just an inherent tenseness to New York anyway, right? There and being in the city when in any city when panic starts to grip it, like you can feel it. And people in New York City, they live, they live in these postage stamp size. Um, apartments, right? I mean, even some wealthy people in Manhattan, they live in like eight, you know, 700 square feet. It's very in enclosed. So when you talk about shutting down a city like New York and telling people to stay home, it's a very different thing than telling people in LA. Because in New York, your life is very, very much outside of your apartment and around people, right? You go to the deli, you go to the, the park and you play checkers and just, you know, you go, you go to the theater. Nobody lives in New York because their apartment is so great, right? And so just if you picture that, like, stay in your apartment, right? I mean, that the, the fear would grip in, in New York, I think, like no place else. I think it is exceptional in many regards. So I will get to the, that kind of timeline, though, very, very soon, because that is important. The sequence of events really, really matters in, in this event. Here's another example. I don't know if some of you know Andy Slavitt. If you don't, it's probably for the best. But um, you know, this, is, this is part of the, this is what he tweeted back in July after this initial event is, uh, uh, occurred. And it was like, yay, New Yorkers, you did it healthcare heroes, and I would say that this narrative persists to this day, and it's going to be hard to undo. Another sense of, of scale, uh, most of the deaths, uh, you know, I, ironically, the bulk of the deaths occurred in 15 days, right? 15 days to slow the spread, you know, 13,000 more deaths occurred in, in 15 days, the mortality equivalent of four and a half times uh, the 9-11 events, right? Just to give perspective to, to New Yorkers. And it's astounding to me that people are just like, well, yeah, the virus, the, vi the virus hit us. Um, but, that's, but that's what people say. Um, another fascinating um, point about sense of scale, New York City proper 
is comprised of five boroughs, um, you know, five counties, and there's some boroughs that have the same name as the, the county and, and some, some that don't. But um, it, it's interesting that New York County, Manhattan, and Staten Island saw a lower increase in mortality. The CDC's explanation for Manhattan is that people fled Manhattan. And I do think that's true that a lot of the rich fled to you know, their place in the Hamptons or, or Cape Cod or what, what, what have you. So the emptying out of Manhattan could explain some of that because I would say there's fewer people that went to the hospital. So that, that I, I could, can explain. And Staten Island, um, you know, there, there's people have told me that there's a different vibe there among uh, some different different groups of people. So I'm not going to get into all the possibilities, but uh, uh, you know, apparently, I, I kind of joke too that the, apparently water is protective, right? Because we've got the two island bur boroughs that you know the virus didn't strike as as hard. Um, but the, the differences are, are are fascinating when you're looking at that that kind of that kind of comparison. Um, that this is just another view, um, you know, same, just a bar graph comparison that the scale, 27,000. A great comparison for me, uh, probably because I live in Chicago, in Chicago land, but um, is, is Chicago, when you scale for uh, the, the population, when you adjust for population, we see that New York City, yes, it is bigger, but by far in terms of population, yes, it's denser, but it is head and shoulders above Chicago, which also experienced pretty severe mortality during that time. And I find that pretty fascinating from a spread theory perspective, because in Chicago, we had the first cases announced in January, um, third week of January or so. New York City didn't announce its first case until um, March 1st. So, but in neither city in all cause mortality, daily all cause mortality, do you see anything that looks like, oh, the virus is spreading, the virus is spreading, the virus is spreading. In both cases, it happens after, um, after lock, so to speak, lockdown orders and, and other inter interventions. One more point, I think this is my final point about scale. But, you know, people talk about 1918. I, I went and looked and New York City has every death certificate digitized from 1850 to 1949. And they have some line, line item data associated as, as well. When I take 1918's daily all-cause mortality versus 2020, 2020 exceeds uh, that, that period that I would call it panic period. I think I would also call 1918 maybe a panic-driven event as, as well, based on the how fast the mortality went up and how fast it went back back down. But right now, the New York uh, New York City of uh, Department of Health uh, Bureau of Vital Statistics, you know, still tells everybody that you know 2020 wasn't like 1918. It was it was close, and if if you look at just the event the, it, itself, it actually. It, it, it's higher, which I find hard hard to believe, right? So we're saying that that COVID was more deadly than the the storied 1918 flu pandemic, really, really. So I I find that I find that really fascinating. Who died in New York uh, is a key question um, that we don't have really a lot of a lot of answers to, but I do think it's worth just showing you some quick things about age that the age profile of just deaths, and I'll get to COVID deaths later, but the age profile, if we just break it up into 20 to 69 and then 70, um, 70 plus, I mean, insofar as percent increase, these two age groups were very, very, sim very similar, almost, well, e equal, really. So we had a ton of young, younger people dying, people in age groups that we know are not susceptible to death by SARS-CoV-2 infection and, and, and things that might result from that. So again, New York is an outlier in this regard. This is just a different view of the same data. Again, keep in mind, this, was an this is just over 11 weeks. It's not even a, 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 full, a full year that this, that this occurred. One thing that people have asked me is, do I think that there's a lot of un, undocumented immigrants, so to speak, that died? Um, I don't. I don't know. 
but the New York City uh, uh, mortality, their, their 2020 mortality report, which was just finally released last month, by, by the way, um, they did include some COVID deaths by where people were born. And uh, the overwhelming majority is in the US, but there are a, a number that were born elsewhere. So that could be a starting point for thinking about who, who died um, and, and whether you know, it, was, it was people that there's no record of them being here. In this case, this would be people that there's, that there's record of, but I, I think that's an interesting line of, of, of inquiry. So let's take a look to it at where kind of we see or don't see signals or signs of, of, of COVID. Here's that same daily death graph. And I've superimposed because I haven't yet gotten daily COVID death data from New York City, funny enough. Um, but I've superimposed the line from their from their vital statistics report. So, so you can see what they're what they're saying. Right, right now. New York City says around 20,000 people died from, from COVID during that, that period. So I've lined up the, the timeline. Over 90% of COVID deaths in 2020 occurred in that time frame. And I think it's 93 or 90% 90, 90 of all cause more, excuse me, of excess for the year also occurred in that, in that time frame. Um, so we we don't or the the implication here is like look COVID struck New York City like a series of bombs going off and and then it left the city alone. Um, I, I don't understand quite how people rationalize that. I, I guess if you're in the spread theory my, mindset, it's like oh look it it picked off the most vulnerable and then left everybody alone because the general population gained immunity. I, I don't know all the ins and outs of that, which actually I think kind of helps me because then I can just ask stupid questions. I can be that like kid in class. It's like, hey, how does that work? Because there's a lot of there's a lot of vulnerable people still left in New York City, right? So what what happened? What happened there? So I, fi I find that view uh, fascinating because it just raises questions about claims about SARS-CoV-2 in, in general, at least in, in, in my mind. If we look at the specific age um, ranges, just really quick, insofar as COVID is, is concerned, um, you can see that these increases in mortality from 2019 to 2020 in these groups, in, in some cases are effectively um, being blamed on COVID. Right, COVID is being used to explain um, or potentially explain in some way. For example, you know, 827 of the 993 extra deaths among people ages 50 to 54. Um, these, you know, lo looking back, the these statistics just they they defy what we know about this virus and, and raise raise a lot of different different questions. So again, like in, just in all cause mortality, like we don't see sign of spreading deadly virus either before or, or after. Um, this is Ben Martin's view, if, if all of you use or know, are aware of um, the US mortality, but just looking, looking all the way back further, like there's no, there's nothing happening there, there whatsoever. So when I look at a, a spike like this, I'm like, that, that's an event. Like if I didn't know about, you know, a, a, a virus, I mean, I, I would just think something very cataclysmic happened to go up and then come all the way back down below, ba below baseline. We also don't see anything really in just natural cause deaths. This one's going back to 2014, but, um, you know, we just, th there's no real signals, like when you take out the non-natural causes. If I look at just respiratory disease deaths, I don't see much going on there, certainly not compared to 2018. I don't remember anybody closing schools and freaking out in 2018. I don't think you, you do either. If I take out just the P&I, you know, we have some elevated P&I in those earlier weeks. Um, but it's not, it's not really anything to write home about. 
Um, and it's it's low. It's low right before the the the, the cataclysm. Cataclysm. Um, what about Alzheimer's deaths, for example? Like, do we see anything in Alzheimer's? Not not really. I mean, this is the general category of nervous system deaths, but not not too much going on there. What about heart? Heart related. Again, this is just the big category, but I'm not seeing much there either. 2018, yes, not, not so much in 2020 in those early months. What about place of death? Hospitals. I mean, if, if there's some new virus that's adding you know, risk of mortality, you would expect hospital deaths to be going up. I don't see it there. Uh, sorry, this switches to a bar graph um, view, but somebody's home. Were there more people dying at home right before in any appreciable way, right, right before it hit? I don't see that. When I look at nursing home and hospice, we do see a rise um, right, right before, or in February, ex excuse me. Um, some, something I think that's notable about that, and I'm not dismissing it outright as some kind of potential something, but I do think some points about that are notable. Um, the numbers are small overall, and they're driven by, when I've, when I've looked, they're driven by circulatory and, and nervous system deaths in, in, those, in those places. Um, the other point, excuse me, I have to go back. Um, is that, you know, when I look at the 10 week totals, it's like running behind these prior years, not, not ahead of. And then really importantly, mid February, 2020, the New York Department of Health, New York City Department of Health, excuse me, issued an alert to nursing homes, telling them to plan for COVID-19. So I, you know, I don't know what people did or didn't do in that time, but I, but I think that's, interesting, right? That, it, that that's the time uh, we, we see a rise, a, a bit of a rise in those, in those deaths. If we look at older, older groups, age 70 plus, around that time, we see a little bit of a, a bump. But again, I, I don't know statistically that I would call this a, a signal, but that's what the age, the age uh, groups look like. Other sources of data, I think are fascinating to look at and say, do we see signs of COVID in, for example, people calling for an ambulance? This timeline is fascinating because we can see the calls to uh, emergency medical services and they're sorted here into non-life-threatening and life-threatening. We see the non-life-threatening start to go up when the case is announced. The first case. Isn't that interesting? A few days later, Cuomo was on the news, you know, telling people not to panic. Don't, don't panic, people. This is this is fine. Everything's everything's going to be fine. People are still people are still panicking. The the 16th at the bottom there, I should have put this on here, but um the 15th, I think was the 15th, 15 days to stop the spread, the federal notice, or that maybe that was the 16th. Um, a couple of days later, he's telling people not not to panic, but but there is some degree of of panic going on. The question, uh, obviously, is 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 it just panic? Is there spread of something going on? What kinds of health issues are are going going on there? A lot of these calls for life threatening were people reporting that they couldn't breathe and heart issues was a was a big one during during that that time emergency department visits plummeted which is counter narrative because the narrative was that we have to save the hospitals new york hospitals are becoming becoming overwhelmed there was a little bit of a like constant uh i don't want to call it a, a surge but there, there's some indications in system-wide data and when I look at individual hospitals that after the shutdown was announced, people started going to the emergency room for like every little cough that they have. There, there, there is that. But overall, the volume of people going to the emergency departments and the intake of the hospitals 
was was down. This was this was true nationwide as well, although not quite as dramatic as a plummet in some places as in New York City. I find this really interesting too. I've learned how in, in studying all of this, I've just become more aware of how much what people do when it comes to their sickness is maybe influenced by choices that they're making, things that they're hearing on the news. This is emergency departments for ILI specifically. ILI in the United States is um, fever of 100 or more and a sore throat and or cough. So not a hugely remarkable season here. There are There is some elevated visits in late um, January, early part of February. My own belief is that that's somewhat fueled by people hearing about the, you know, the China virus, as Trump was calling it back then. But we have a, a, a decrease. It, it, it falls down pretty, pretty normally, as you would expect that kind, that time of year, until the case is announced. Case is announced on March first, and then we see the ILI visits go back up. I'm really struck by that. I'm really struck by um, what what it the the influence of or or the association I should say between what people are are hearing and then what they have a tendency to go do. This is directly from a health bulletin that hospitals got from the New York City Health Department. And what I find interesting about this view is they're not giving health care workers or hospital administrators a sense of what's happening with emergency department visits overall, right? This just shows ILI. So it's like, hey, a virus is here. Look, it, it, it's coming. And I think that this helped induce panic among one of, one of many things that was inducing panic among healthcare workers. A lot of people say or have said early on that the subways um, are responsible for the, the spread. Um, I, I take issue with that theory, but I, I do think it's interesting to look at what the actual subway data was. People were beginning to stop using the subway before the official shutdown order was, was issued. So whatever you believe about the subways, I think the actual data on subway use is is worth con considering. But you know, by the end of you know, or excuse me, this is the timeline now. So so now let's let's look at the timeline of events that somebody brought up earlier, right? We've got the first case. It was a 37 year old woman back from Iran, not hospitalized, perfect, perfectly fine. We have the uh, approval of the, the FDA approved an EUA for New York's, um, New York's test that their Wadsworth lab was, was using. I think I'm getting the detail right on that. We had Mayor de Blasio in that time doing a series of tabletop exercises around you know, the emergency plans that might have to be put into place. On March 7th, Cuomo declared the state of emergency for the, for the whole state. March 15th was a big day because it was the day that really hospitals and other labs were cleared to do their tests. So that's really when we see the advent of the mass testing, big, big COVID is, is what, what I call it, on, on March 15th. That day, the mayor said schools were uh, going to close. The following day is the Trump saying 15 days to slow the spread. March 20th is when Cuomo signed his official stay home order and something else called Matilda's Law, which wasn't a law at all. It's probably illegal. I'll show you that in a, in a second. That, but that's the, that's the official shutdown date. But all before here, New Yorkers are staying home. Things are, things are, shutting, are shutting down. It's not like there was all this bustle going on in the city and then people stopped March, March 20th. March 23rd was the first official day of schools being being closed. That was the day after a, a, a weekend. And just notice, by the time 15 days to slow the spread is, is coming to a close, well, well, it was never going to be 15 days to slow the spread, I can tell you that, but mortality was very high in, in New York, very, very high. 
So I, I tell people, look, no matter what, it was never going to be 15 days because New York was off the charts already. In that time, too, we had kind of a battle, a political battle going on, the blue state governors versus Trump with Cuomo leading the charge for the blue state governors and saying, you know, the, we, need, we need a federal response. We need these things from the federal government. We, we need leadership. And there was a huge battle that heated up between the, those two. I mentioned Matilda's Law uh, just, just really quick. Th this was effectively, uh, in, in my opinion, an illegal quarantine order issued for the elderly. In other words, like stay home. Matilda was Cuomo's mom. So he couched it as like, I'm protecting the elderly. I don't know if focus protection advocates would call this focus protection. I, I don't. Um, you think about, you know, I'm just going to make a person up, Ernie Goldstein, who lives in a rent control apartment on the Upper East Side. He's got his routines every day. He's 75 years old. He's in okay health. You know, you tell that guy that, you know, he's about to die and he can't go out and, you know, go to his synagogue or be with his friends or that person's chances of dying, virus or no virus, are very, are very high. So when we look at home deaths, I mean, Matilda's Law, or just the general shut, shut down order, plays a different kind of role in a city in a city like New York, I think, than, than in, in other, other places. Um, there's been a lot of talk lately about ventilators. I've been talking about ventilators for a long time, but I think it's interesting to go back and listen to what Cuomo was saying about the ventilators. Hopefully you can hear this. And this is an example of like the political battle heating up. Where are the ventilators? Where are the ventilators? Where are the gowns? Where's the PPEs? Where are the masks? Where are they? Where are they if they're doing it? When we went to war, we didn't say, uh, any company out there want to build a battleship? Who wants to build a battleship? It's not how you did it. The president said it's a war. It is a war. Well, then act like it's a war. And it's not anti-business. We have been working around the clock, scouring the globe. We've procured about 7,000 ventilators. We need, at a minimum, an additional 30,000 ventilators. You cannot buy them. You cannot find them. Every state is trying to get them. Other countries are trying to get them. The capacity is limited. They're technical pieces of equipment. They're not manufactured in two days or four days or seven days or 10 days. So this is a critical and desperate need for ventilators. Right, I'll stop it there. His, uh, his press conferences were hugely entertaining for, for sure, if, if, if nothing else. What, what's ironic and, and tragic is with Cuomo saying, you pick the 26,000 people are gonna die, 27,000 people did die. 27,000 extra people did die in 11 weeks. And I would say it's because of, because of the interventions, a ton of them, not just one thing, not just, not just ventilators, not just the, the stay home orders, which I'll get to a little later, but this, this was the narrative. It was a war, there was an unseen enemy, Trump wasn't doing enough, the blue state governors needed more ventilators to, to fight this unseen enemy. That's the political narrative that was driving a lot of this. So yeah, by, by the end of the, the 15 days and, and beyond, the mortality keeps going up and up and, and, and up. Um, and there was like, the, the damage was done is kind of what I, what I tell people, it's too late. It, it, it was too late. And no matter if it was a virus or not, people were dead. Um, this is just a weekly view. This is a kind of distilled, like there was an urging to stay home. There were stay at home orders. That's when the mortality starts to go up. It plummets back to baseline, starts to get up to excess territory by the end of the, the year. When we're talking about well, where was COVID or where was SARS-CoV-2, COVID, COVID whatever, you know, whatever, and I know people have different views about what that is, um, percent positivity was high, really high. And I've had a lot of scientists and doctors try to explain this to me. 75% coming back positive when you're giving thousands of tests a day, is that, that raises a lot of questions for me as, as a lay person. For, for me, I'm like, okay, so this thing was already here or whatever is being tested or, or there's something wrong with, with the test. 
but I've told that I have an immature view and I'm not, you know, I don't really know what I'm talking about because I don't know PCR tests, but for, for me, this is a red flag. People will say to me, well, we needed more tests. We needed them earlier. And I say, for what? To, to tell what? Nothing was going on with mortality to tell you that people were dying of something that wasn't killing people in any huge appreciable way. So I don't, under, I don't under, un, understand that. Here's a different view where it's just the daily positive COVID tests against the daily all-cause mor mortality. It's really easy to see here. And again, I know people have different views, but like if you're, if people are dying for a lot of different reasons, and most of, many of them in the hospital and nursing homes, and you have a test that's coming back at a really high rate, that positive allows you to cover up a multitude of sins, especially when you pretty much define a COVID death as somebody who tests positive on that test and then dies 30 years or 60 days later. There's an early study from a group of researchers from Northwell Health, which is one of the bigger um, healthcare systems in the New York metro, metro area that, um, <laughs> that I, I don't think got the attention that it, it should. Northwell Health is, is 17 hospitals and they were also had, had some other labs that were testing as, as well in other settings. I mean, this is straight from their study at the, at the time where you can see like not only in hospitals, but in urgent care and other settings like nursing homes, they had a huge percent positive coming back, breaking it down by um, borough or, or, or region. I mean, approaching 80% of tests, of thousands of tests coming back, so something was going on there. I love this graph from the study. Uh, it breaks it down by gender. You can see number of persons tested is on the side. The positivity rate is out of control on the other side. But notice how it's labeled. Positivity rate for SARS-CoV-2 RNA. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's what it was. It's detecting for the RNA. Um, so I, I appreciate the, spe the specificity about what was coming back positive. These weren't necessarily all sick people or people who needed to be tested. Um, this line from the study is funny to me. Uh, the researcher said, our data reveal that SARS-CoV-2 incidents emerged rapidly and almost simultaneously across a broad demographic population in that region. Uh, these findings support the premise that the infection was widely distributed prior to virus testing availability. I completely agree <laughs> What those others are saying, the punchline is it was everywhere, but it wasn't resulting in excess mortality. New York City also engaged in antibody testing very early on. Um, I know I don't know a lot about antibody testing, being kind of a lay, lay person, but again, these rates, even early on, I know the sample sizes were small. We don't have information about how the samples were, were taken, if it was done in any kind of random or systematic way, but right away the rate was really high. Then it dips low with more tests that they're, they're giving, but we don't have the information that we would need about who all was being tested. What I see there, honestly, um, and maybe this is tinfoil hat, I see like, oh shoot, there's a really high prevalence of this thing. Let's give more tests so we can get that rate down so people don't know that it was already here. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think the antibody testing data should get more attention. When I think about what happened in, in New York, and actually this goes for any country and anywhere throughout the United States, I think that the number one question that people don't ask that there's plenty of data for is where do people die? And what does where people died tell us about how people died or how they couldn't have died because of where they died? So let's take a look at this in New York City. Every death certificate in the United States has one has options for one of seven places of death. Hospital inpatient, outpatient or emergency department, which really is all hospital for all intents and purposes, especially in the spring period. Nursing homes or long-term care facilities, hospice facilities, so not home hospice care, but facilities, the person's home, or, or apartment or residence, DOA to the hospital or other. Other is a little, can be a little bit of a catch-all care 
uh, category. Some kinds of adult care homes can be in other. It just it just depends when I drill down and I look at different states and how different states define things, the guidance that they give. But other would also include like on the street or in your car and in a car accident. So this is literally where you died. So the normal year I'm using here, the year before in these weeks is 2019. So let's look at 2020. You see the 2020 amount followed by the increase or decrease the percent change and the percent of the total uh, increase or decrease for that category. The majority of deaths that occurred in this time, there's no getting around it, were in hospitals. Hospitals or healthcare settings if you want to include, include nursing homes. There were a lot of deaths in nursing homes. We don't know how many, after all the nursing home policy craziness, we still don't know all cause mortality for how many nursing home residents died in the hospitals. New York State says that about 2,000 COVID attributed nursing home deaths occurred in hospitals. That still leaves us with like 12, 13,000 quote extra people where I'm like, who were these people that died in the hospitals? So when we're talking about ventilators per se, well, what, about, what about the ventilators? Um, the hospital numbers would be that starting point. Although I would also like to know how many people who died in nursing homes and at home had been in a hospital um, and, and were, were di discharged. That would be some, and had been on a ventilator. That would be something to, to think about or had had certain kinds of, of treatment. Another quick question, Jessica, I'm sorry. Can you go back to that slide? Yep. So yep. Th did you try to tease out Along the way, trying to hide his uh, bumbling of the long-term long -term care home facility handling, Cuomo changed the, the changed the tracking methodology so he would so so that a person who was in an LTC and died on the way to the hospital got counted as a hospital death versus an LTC death. I, I, or, or some, I, I'm not sure I'm setting it right, but I know that he right. did some he he did some hand hey, hey, some are. hand waving, yeah. Yeah, so I'm actually going to defend Tomok Como for a second here. When the oh, okay, I'm out. That's it. No, no, no. Bye. No, 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 no. no, no. no, listen, no listen, listen, listen. So, so first of all, this is CDC data. CDC place of death data was always publicly reported. Always. Like, so when people are like, oh, somebody's hiding this or that, I'm like, it, even during the time, I remember this, I was like, where people died is right here. It, it, we know we know where people died. Excellent. Well, but okay, but cool, what thanks. we didn't, but what we didn't know, right, is how many nursing home residents died in the hospitals. And what Cuomo said at the time, he's like, "Who cares where people died? They they died." Which, but I, I, so on one hand, I understand what he's saying, and I almost hear it now as like a defense of the hospitals because if if six thousand, I'm just making up a number, if six thousand of those hospital inpatient deaths. Our, our nursing home residents, well, now I have questions about, you know, the treatment they received the hospital or why they were sent to the hospital at, at, at all. But he did, other states were reporting their total nursing home resident deaths, regardless of where they died. And, and he wasn't doing that and then tried to, to cover it up. But we had the reverse, like in Illinois, 70% Wait, let me get this right. Yes, 70% of nursing home resident COVID deaths in spring 2020 occurred in the hospitals. And most of the deaths in the hospitals were nursing home residents. So I, I that's why people are like, well, the nursing home policy, I'm like, I, I don't know, that, that still doesn't answer what was going on in the hospitals. Does, does that Yes, sense? excellent does, nuance. Thank you, super, super. Yeah. Um, and so far as COVID, I mean, look, th this, this is just outrageous to me. Um, and yes, we had incent we have incentives in the United States. Yes, hospitals got a bigger payout if COVID was on the death certificate. That's not a conspiracy theory. That's what the CARES Act provided for. So, you know, the, these statistics, you know, we, most of the COVID deaths by far were in, were in hospitals, not in nursing homes. We had a whole lot of ex excess in nursing homes uh, for other reasons, right? But it's it's not where most of the COVID deaths were. 
I'm really suspicious of COVID assigned deaths at home. I have a lot of questions about that, but maybe I, I'd like to know how many people were in the house, had been in the hospital and then, and then were, were discharged. But you know, these stats, I mean, New York City hospitals would have us believe that um, nothing else that was going on caused you know, an extra death, that it was all because of COVID. And that to me is just, you know, it, it, it's outrageous uh, that, that we'd have a hundred, like near a hundred percent of the increase attributed to, to, to COVID. It just, it, it, it doesn't make sense. This is a uh, kind of a, a, a swim lane and what I call like a sw swim lane graph on table. Um, but we, we see a shift. We see a shift in where deaths occur. Yes, most deaths do take place in the hospital or majority take place in the hospital. But we see a shit. We saw uh, that even more deaths took place in the hospital in 2020. That that's a huge shift to me. And I don't study place of death for a living or anything. But um, that that sets off my spidey senses. There, deaths in nursing home facilities actually didn't change all that much. At least not in a in a matter commensurate with the with the narrative around it. So those shifts are fascinating to me. And if you look weekly, week by week, those of you who work in a hospital, who have ever worked in a hospital, um, maybe you can speak to this. I, I don't know. That is so many bodies. Look at the increase in this four-week event. The morgue trucks were on the news. I, I believe it. I mean, if if this, if these things actually, if this happened, there was a lot of bodies that had to be handled in a very, very short period of time. The other thing to note is that if you look at the increase for the whole U.S. in those weeks, New York City was a substantial, New York went first, I say, New York went first. There was a huge increase in, um, or not huge increase, New York City constituted a massive proportion of increases in hospital inpatient deaths. This alone should trigger an investigation of every single hospital, but we don't see anything like that. Here's just the week to week view. This is inpatient only. It's astounding to me, absolutely astounding what happened there. This graph is a, a nice view because, and I, um, because it shows in time series what was occurring. The deaths in hospitals went up first, then nursing homes and uh, uh, deaths in its home followed, or, so to speak. I mean, they were rising as, as well. If, if we if we zoom in on it, right? But it, it's still outsized in the hospital. Cuomo's hospital order in, in many ways was actually more deadly, I think, than, than the nursing home advisory. Um, and the nursing home advisory was just simply, uh, I don't mean to minimize it exactly, but it's just like, hey, nursing homes, you can't reject somebody uh, on the basis of COVID status. COVID was already in the nursing homes. It didn't get introduced by people coming back from the hospital who were persistently positive and would have tested positive probably for weeks weeks after. So the just the timeline here defies um, the nursing home narrative as well. Again, people did die in nursing homes, but you can see where the real issue was. The hospital order that Cuomo issued did, did a few things. It told hospitals, even though there was no, in the data I've seen, like, I don't, I don't see that they needed to do this, but he ordered hospitals to increase their capacity by 50%. He removed oversight for decisions that were made by residents and, and other, other staff. He absolved people of uh, close record keeping and, and did, did a host of other things that were essentially a green light for disaster medicine. And not disaster medicine, like something is happening, like Hurricane Katrina just came through and now we have to do something. It was for an anticipated disaster, which is, is really interesting. And I think it ended up creating death. Insofar as what doctors were told and nurses were told, this is just one example from a health alert that, that went out. Um, some things that they were told to, to do or to use not to do, not to use. I think that oxygen saturation is a little bit on the, I, I don't know about that for a definition of hypoxia. There was encouragement to use remdesivir, whatever you think about that. I don't have strong feelings either way. It's not a topic that I know, know a lot about. 
But even just that first line of currently medical care for COVID is supportive. In other words, we can't really do anything for this. That, that, that's the message that was being sent. And I would say they had been doing stuff for whatever manifestations the virus had for months um, before it had, before it had a, a, a name. There was also a lot of encouragement from professional organizations and other sources to not give CPR, to issue unilateral D DNRs. This, this, this was everywhere. And so doctors and nurses, whatever you think about their ethical or, or you know, moral responsibilities in the end, they were being told that this was a virus that was new and they couldn't really do all the old stuff for, and when somebody tests positive, here's what you have to, have to do under a lot of duress. And I, I think this hospital inpatient um, toll is because of what people were being told. We unfortunately don't have the ventilator data that we would like to have, or that I, that I would like to have. This is as good as it gets. Um, this is patients currently ICU intubated from March 26 to May 31st. I have the data beyond this too, but the data set starts um, the, the 26th. We have a uh, change in intubations. Actually, I, I have a graph of that somewhere too. But th this guy, Richard uh, Levitin, I hope he's not on the call, but um, he's, he's known, he developed some kind of device for airway intubation. Some of you might know what it is, but he was really prominent in the beginning about like, uh, about hypoxia and people being able to, to talk without, you know, without, with having low, low oxygen. Um, I think it's, I, I've tried to engage with him, but he blocked me. Um, but the, you know, there, there's something going on there where they were intubating everyone and then started to started to stop. That that's what I see in all the data that I I looked at. There was a study that came out from the Northwell Hospital System early on. Uh, I think it was published the 20th of April, if I'm not mistaken, or some, there thereabouts. And the study endpoint went through April 6th. Um, but that data came out and said like, hey, 88% of pe people placed on ventilators in this study, you know, died 90 something percent of people age 65 and over. So that study came out and very quickly, the narrative around that study changed and the authors issued a, a clarifying note or, or two in, in the study. Um, but we, I think it was known that the ventilators, among other things, were killing people, but no, nobody wanted to say what, it, what exactly was, was going on. I'm going to skip that um, for, for now. Um, let me show one thing for now, and then I'm going to pause. But th there's a great um, real-time account from a New York City doctor Mount Sinai, uh, and it's told in the first person. And I think this is, for me, like one of the best examples of what somebody was experiencing, assuming it's authentic. But he he's basically panicked and he's like, okay, we, we planned, we planned for this. I've got people in the emergency department that are positive and they need a bed. I don't know why they needed a bed, right? But they he's like they're positive, so they need a bed. There's other people under evaluation. Um, people are dropping like flies. Um, we're, you know, 50 and 60 year olds are being, being intubate, intubated. There's no real improvement therapy. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that we have like murderers on our hands here. I think we have some people that were being subjected to some um, psychological duress uh, by, by the messages that they, but that they were being, being told. Um, one more thing, and then I really will pause, but um, more, more, more data that I think is relevant. We don't, see an increase in the number of ambulances going to New York City hospitals. We did see an overall increase in dispatches, though that's why um, that, that's why people heard ambulances, but they were going to people's homes and, and other places where people were dead or, or could not be saved. I mean, really, the whole New York incident can almost be summed up in, in those, those two graphs. I'm Jessica Hockett. Um, I'm going to be uh, sharing some, some data and uh, questions and answers to questions that I have around what the heck happened in New York City in spring 2020. New York City experienced a, an un, almost unfathomable uh, mass casualty event 
at that at that time. I've been involved in an ongoing personal inquiry about, you know, what was the scale of this event, who died, what happened, how do we know, um, how how can how can we tell? And I, I think people forget that New York City was really key to convincing not only Americans but the world that this was a really serious virus that we needed to do something about, that we needed to disrupt everything that we were doing and try to stop or slow the spread of this deadly pathogen. And so answering questions about New York City, which have not been sufficiently answered by anyone, um, I think is, is key to just getting at the heart of what occurred uh, with this whole global viral pandemic de de declaration. Um, moreover, and the mandates that were implemented in the name of slowing the spread, including Vax Passport mandates, like the one that New York City implemented, they were the first one to do so, I believe, in, New in uh, the United States. Could have been San Francisco first. But um, these have not been declared illegal. They, they could come back. Yesterday, the Second Circuit upheld the key to New York Vax Passport um, measure, uh, noting that it was an effective way to combat the spread of COVID-19. COVID um, I don't see any evidence of sudden spread of a, a, a deadly pathogen in New York City, so that would probably be my case against uh, against that, that, that mandate, but I, I want to show you uh, in part why I, why I think that. Um, my hypothesis at this point is that the excess casualties that New York City experienced are wholly or mostly could be explained by the things that were implemented all at once in anticipation of, not in reaction to an actual emergency that was actually occurring. There wasn't a single force or trigger as, as far as I can, can tell. Um, a lot of people wanna say just Okay, it was ventilators and remdesivir. That, that is in the mix, I, I think, but it's not just that one thing. And I think that's really obvious when you look at especially where people died. That is whether they died in the hospital, nursing home, at their own home. We'll take a look at that again. Insofar as a novel virus, uh, it's not that I don't believe in viruses or that I believe SARS-CoV-2 is not a thing. Um, that, that's fine. I, I accept that it is for now, um, but I don't think that you need it in order to explain or start to explain at least what occurred. I do think fraud could be involved in New York City, possibly elsewhere too, but in New York City, I see some sort of signals, um, had some questions, have some concerns that do suggest that uh, fraud, fraud could be involved. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. Just to remind everybody of the scale of the event, this is from the U.S. mortality site. This is weekly all-cause mortality. Um, we have that massive, massive spike. I think only maybe Northern Italy comes close in, in so far as magnitude. Massive spike, an extra 27,000 deaths in 11 weeks. New York City usually experiences around 1,500 deaths a week. At the, the peak in early April, it was around 8,000 that occurred that week. It's just, when we think about the increase in the number of bodies, it's just incredible to think about dwarfs 9-11 by, by a long shot. And perhaps just as uh, shocking is the drop back down to, to baseline, where it stayed, and actually even a little bit below baseline in some places of death until mid to late December. Even just taking out, there were some non-natural uh, cause deaths in that rise, but this is natural cause deaths only. Uh, and you can see that dramatic rise, dramatic fall stays down and doesn't start to creep back up um, into excess territory. And even then it doesn't get su super high compared to 2017 and, and 2018. Um, and so, I, I mean, I would, I would say that that kind of spike is just on its face uh, should raise a lot of questions because it's the kind of thing you would see in an earthquake with aftershocks, uh, not, not in, uh, a virus isn't a bomb <laughs> is something I, I like to say. That's, if you just looked at that spike and you were an alien visitor from another planet and you didn't know what happened, the things that you would guess would probably not be disease. They would be, again, non-natural causes, 
uh, does it or, or or phenomenon like a tidal wave, <laughs> something in, enveloping enveloping the, the the city. This is daily all cause mortality. I like this view because I think of spring 2020 not only in New York but in other locations as a discrete event. And so from almost a historian's perspective, you have to say, okay, when I'm looking at an event, right, an event that happened over a very short period, I want to see day to day to day what was occurring to try to maybe get to the bottom of, of this. Uh, Deborah Burks, in, uh, in, in her book, she talks about, and actually a lot of uh, American officials talk about this, the silent spread of COVID, that it was silently um, seeding in, in hiding in the flu, for example, is one thing that, that people say. Last In my last time's presentation, I showed you that in multiple places I've looked in the weekly data, um, flu data, in um, what else, circulatory disease deaths, different age groupings, I do not see anywhere any impact of a novel deadly pathogen on mortality. I just don't see it. So no sign of spread, drops back down, the, the, the pathogen seemingly disappears or does not have an impact on mortality un, until, until maybe late, later on. And it's not that COVID deaths, or excuse me, it's not that deaths weren't still being attributed um, to the virus. They, they did have some of that, but over 90% of deaths attributed to COVID in New York City occurred in the, the spring. So again, you can see why I call it an event, right? It's like some, something happened, what, what happened there? Uh, if we compare it to Chicago, it's just many, many magnitudes higher. Chicago reported its first cases of COVID uh, much earlier than New York City did. Actually, even New York State reported its first COVID cases sooner than New York City did. New York City's first case was announced on the 1st of March. It was a woman returning from Iran. I think she was 38 or so, not, not hospitalized, not a severe case. Um, so in, with Chicago, New York, and this is true, I think in most places around the world, we, we see mortality go up, not gradually, not, not rising, but we see it dramatically go up after the advent of mass testing and other government interventions. This is a comparison um, of New York with some cities around the world. I'm always looking for uh, this kind of data uh, for, any, for any city, all cause. Daily is my favorite, but if you have weekly or monthly, it'll, it'll do. Um, but New York City is head and shoulders above um, Madrid, again, far above Chicago. I have a lot of questions about Berlin. They apparently did not experience uh, any, any spread or any impact, right, of this deadly pathogen. Um, I guess there could be many reasons for that, but I had not realized before I did this, I didn't realize that Berlin or that, that Germany in general really did not experience excess at, at, that, at that time. Um, I noticed too that Madrid, which was another place besides Italy and Iran that was used to scare Americans and scare scare the world. It's interesting that their event was, you know, came sooner. Um, you also have the dramatic peak and the dramatic fall. That to me uh, strongly suggests non-natural factors at at work. I find this look at what happened pretty interesting. This is something I did recently, where. We see the mortality, all causes, and then just COVID, right, like, like a bomb, go, goes off. But we had a really high, like unusually high, percent positivity rate in New York City. It is not true that they did not have tests. They had more tests than anyone. And in fact, the case reports that Americans were hearing every day were, they were, New York City comprised a huge portion of those cases because of all the testing they were doing, not only in their hospitals, but in urgent care kinds of centers and in nursing homes as well. So they had tests, and in fact, they were retesting people in the, in the hospital. 
there's evidence that they just suddenly tested everybody in the hospital, like right, like pretty much right, right away in, in early March. So it, it's interesting that when you look at that percent positivity, it like pre precedes timing wise, right? This is daily data. So timing wise, it, it precedes the mass, mass casualty. Then again, it drops and then it doesn't get back up even over like 10% per, 10 later on. And it's not because they weren't giving tests. They were giving tests. Um, some tests were, they were coming back positive. And apparently New York City had figured out how to defeat the virus. And that, that was the narrative at, at the time. I remember it well. It's what Andrew Cuomo is the kind of thing that he was saying. The, the virus hit New York harder. And then we learned how to handle it. And we showed everybody how it, how it was, was done. So there was, a, there was a, uh, an incentive there, right, to, to show the world that New York had conquered the virus. I don't know why they didn't tell um, Los Angeles. Los Angeles experienced a huge uh, increase in COVID blamed death and all-cause mortality, uh, including the, their, their hospitals, mo most of all. I don't know why New York City hospitals wouldn't tell um, LA hospitals how to do it, how to handle it, but apparently they had figured it out. If we compare those uh, that positive rate to Chicago back in 2020, Chicago also had had tests, although their push began just a little bit after New York's, about two weeks after New York's. It's it's interesting how you see the positivity rate. It's it's very different. Chicago's never gets over 30 percent, which is still too high in my opinion, or still still raises questions. Let me say that about the test or about what was going on, but. They, they, it, Chicago's never gets over 30%, but New York starts out just massively, massively high. Um, and they, they were, like I said, they were giving a lot of tests. Here's the, uh, no, I already had that one. Sorry, I already had this in a different graph. This just emphasizes that there's, um, that there's nothing happening with mortality, then it explodes, then it drops back. Oh, I know. So, I, I want you to notice that there's lots of positive tests, but mortality doesn't start to approach those, those levels again. My guess right now is that hospitals stopped mass testing like they were, and that nursing homes did as, as well. And that most of those tests, I'm submitting a FOIA to the health department for this, but that the source of most of those tests came from other places, um, other facilities, you know, like, um, like C CVS, right? Like kind of like phar pharmacies, pla places like, like that. But again, somehow New York had um, learned how to manage the virus, so, so to speak. This is another view that uh, I've looked at that recently that, that raises a lot of questions for me. This is case counts, which, you know, cases, as we all know, is really just positive, positive tests, uh, not necessarily associated with, with symptoms per se, or, or even respiratory symptoms. But New York and other cities here had these probable cases and probable deaths for a time. And I find it really interesting that probable cases go up when, again, there's no shortage of tests. So I'm not really sure why probable cases went up later in the year, but hospitalizations, meaning COVID positive patients, are way down. So this is part of what leads me to believe that, or maybe there was a change in the test that New York City was, was giving, right? Maybe their protocols for testing patients and nursing home residents changed as, as well. It's, it, it's hard to say, but that raises a lot of questions for me. I may have mentioned this last time, but New York City is a, a global outlier, as far as I can tell, insofar as the number of young, younger people that died during this event. They had a massive loss of life years. This is a comparison of all-cause deaths between ages 20 to 69, and then more elderly deaths over, over age 70. 
the you'll see that the one third ish right is that right of the excess or the I, I say increase I don't love the term excess but an in increase in mortality was people under age seventy um, and and pretty much right off the bat too so when people say well it's all those old people and you know it's that um, what do people the the dry tinder well. We had a lot of younger people too that that died. Um, here's another view of the the, the breakdown. Obviously, there there were more there there were more a greater proportion comes from a little bit older, a little bit closer to to 69. But it's it's really astounding. I haven't seen this profile demographic profile any anywhere else. Um, that's just another view. Oh, I know what this is. So this is. Um, deaths with COVID-19 somewhere on the death certificate, whether as underlying cause or as contributing cause in the smaller age groups. So, so you can see. And the bottom line here is that New York City uh, wants us to accept, especially for younger people, that uh, COVID was really the motivator of the excess, right? Which is not that that's contrary to what we know to be true or what we believe to be true at this point anyway about the IFR of the, the the pathogen. One more view of the young deaths. Where did they occur? In the United States, we have several places of death that are reported, more than several, actually seven. Um, medical facility inpatient, outpatient or ER, uh, which is most which some of that that is hospital as well hospice facility, so that's different than hospice care, right? Because you could have hospice care in a hospital or at home. This is a hospice facility. Um, care homes are grouped se separately from that. Then we have dead on arrival. That is, um, you were picked up alive from your home or your, your residence or wherever, um, could be from a care home, and you were en route to the hospital, but you died before you got there. Your personal home, whether that's your apartment or townhome. Um, and then other places would be like um, a homeless shelter, uh, the street, uh, just anything that falls, falls outside of that. So note that most of these younger deaths occurred in the hospital among inpatients. These younger people were admitted and treated, and there's COVID on the death certificate the equivalent pretty much of all of that increase. For me, these younger deaths are reason alone to demand for every American, let alone New Yorkers, to demand that the death certificates for these individuals be released and an independent medical record review conducted in every New York City hospital. It's, it's truly astounding. Looking at where people died regardless of their age, we can see that most of the increase is was in hospitals. There was a lot of attention, still is a lot of attention on what happened in nursing homes. I'll get to that again in a little in a little bit. But regardless, the bulk of the excess comes from hospitals. Really big chunk at home as well. And I'll get at some of the forces that were at work there in a little bit. Insofar as COVID being on the death certificate, again, we see that it's identified as not only a contributing cause, but underlying cause in pretty much all of the hospital deaths, or the, the equivalent of all of that increase. In other words, the implication, again, is that COVID caused this. Nobody died in the hospital or no extra people, so to speak, died in the hospital for any other reason than sudden spread of a pathogen. That, that's the implication of these data. Notice that in nursing homes that only, I'm putting that in quotes here, only 17, 1800 of those deaths have COVID as underlying cause. There was testing going on in nursing homes. That's irrefutable with, with the, the testing the testing data. So we had a lot of non-COVID death in nursing homes 
for ver various various reasons. Um, a lot of that's Alzheimer's, but there's there's other kinds of deaths in there as well. And again, massive number of deaths at home. I question the 1,400 deaths that were attributed to COVID happening at home. I would really like to know how many of those people were discharged from the hospital. I'd really like to know how many people's bodies were just swabbed by the medical examiner. Um, I, I, question, I, I question that, that at attribution. Insofar as the timing of the event, and this is the main uh, places of death for New York City. Hospital rose first by, by, by just a little bit. Um, towers over the other places of death, especially if you, I don't have it added here, but if I added the green to the red, right, that, that's pretty much, that's hospital. And then you see nursing home and uh, decedent's home as, as well. This is just another view of the inpatient, um, inpatient view. Um, at the time, New York City's hospital inpatient deaths comprised the bulk of all deaths in the United States. That increase is astounding. The numbers that we were hearing every day in the United States and that we we're hearing from New York in particular, they were reporting at the time hospital numbers. Um, very quickly, I have questions about that as well, but does that occur at home? Those take longer to process, even in, in normal times, they, they, take, they take longer to process. So those numbers we were hearing is what was going on or reportedly going on in the hospitals. Huge, huge share of the national total. I'm not sure people realized that at the time. I know I didn't. Um, it's something I've seen only looking later. Cuomo's quote, nursing home order got a lot of attention but he also issued other orders and other things also happened that impacted what was going on and what the hospitals were doing and what they were being told to, to do. Um, I find it really interesting that hospitals were absolved of close record keeping for patients. He removed uh, requirements for oversight by residents and in, interns and, and others. He, this is very odd, he allowed EMS services to transport patients to locations other than healthcare facilities. Uh, that could have been because of anticipated uh, field hospitals, right? Like the Javits Center or in Central, Central Park, the, the ships like the Mercy ship that was sent, maybe that was done in anticipation of, of that. Um, but there were a lot of things that were done or allowed in, in hospitals, uh, in, including suspending visitors, right? There, there were no, I call them witnesses. There were no third party witnesses in hospitals, not only in New York, but that was true all around the country. And in fact, many places around the world, I would contend that removing visitors or removing advocates, that would increase the risk of mortality for everybody in the hospital. And that's, I'm not being disparaging to to, to doctors, other uh, reasons that we have that we have advocates advocates there, and that that wasn't the the case. I think I mentioned last time that there was some general guidance from the New York City Department of Public Health about treatment that was issued to hospitals on March fifteenth. They uh, they they sort of said, uh, I'm translating here, but um, we can't do anything for it, is how I interpret this. Um, avoid the corticosteroids. There was uh, guidance to, you know, try remdesivir. There's sort of a, what I would consider, I'm, I'm not a medical professional, but like that hypoxia guideline seems a little high um, to, to me, I have questions about that, but that was the general treatment guidance that was given. Not getting, gonna get into all the specifics of this today, but insofar as ventilator guidance and where that came from, we remember the push for ventilators. Where are the ventilators, Cuomo said. There was a battle that developed between the President of the United States and governors, including mine, um, JB, JB Pritzker, about needing more ventilators. Well, where did that push come from? 
A lot of people talk about the WHO uh, guidance, the WHO guidance that was issued on March 13th um, and some it, advice or studies from, from China. I think that's true. I think that's part of it. But I've also seen some, some other things that uh, played, I think played a role um, based on some contemporaneous accounts. At, at the time, there was a group in Italy that issued a, uh, I would say a very ethically questionable uh, document in early March. It was controversial even in Italy, I've, I've learned about use of ventilators, ventilator app, um, allocation, how to basically how to decide who's gonna live and who's going, going to die. There was also, there's also a really interesting interview and report that was put out by JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. It was recorded on March 13th, published on March 16th uh, with a, a doctor, I think an anesthetist in, or anesthesiologist in Italy about what he was seeing on the ground in, I think it was Mil Milan or in, in Northern Italy. And he's talking with the editor of JAMA he emphasizes the use of, of ventilators as, as well. It's a fascinating interview to watch. I encourage you to do so if you're interested. But also the state of New York had its own guidelines and its guidelines were originally developed in 2007. Then there was a new set that came out in November, 2015. And this was in, in anticipation of a flu pandemic, a global flu, flu pandemic. The group that developed these met, had a kind of an emergency call on, I think it was March 16th, and some heads of uh, hospitals were involved in the call as well. And there was a, a look at these guidelines and how they would apply. My understanding based on a, a New Yorker article on, on that meeting is that there wasn't really concrete changes that came out of it and that hospitals were or felt like they were left to decide for themselves. Haven't been able to corroborate all of that yet, but all of that to say, I don't know that we can blame China necessarily for or entirely for the ventilator push. I think it was coming from other sources and had been anticipated already uh, years years before in addressing a you know sudden spread of a, a virus, a flu virus at, at minimum. JAMA also had put out and, and other sources, other professional organizations had put out guidance to doctors about not using CPR and about the um, moral permissibility of writing a unilateral DNR. There's multiple accounts of that happening with the, the DNRs um, sort of not, not on a whim, but maybe out of, out of fear. Um, certainly telling doctors not to administer CPR because it might spread the virus or they might put themselves at risk. All of these things contributed to, to the, the fear and um, probably to poor de decision-making as, as well. If we look at some of the things that were issued besides that hospital order, we have different forces that seem to have contributed, and these aren't the only things, but they're some of the things that came along around this uh, event. We had the hospital order. We also had something called Matilda's Law, where basically Cuomo told old people to stay home and that they shouldn't go out. Um, like a it, it, it's so funny that it's called a law because it wasn't a law at all. It was an illegal illegal order in, in, in my opinion. The nursing home advisory is the one that has gotten so much attention that um, said that hospitals, or excuse me, that nursing homes could not reject a new admission or a returning resident on the basis of COVID positivity. Um, so people have said that when nursing home residents came back from the hospital that were still COVID positive. They spread it to everybody in the nursing home and that's what you know, contributed to the toll in the, the, the nursing homes. Um, I think there's reason to question that 
narrative, especially if you're somebody like me that doesn't necessarily believe that there was like a, a spreading, like highly contagious uh, pathogen necessarily around or at, at, at play. But also uh, COVID was already in the nursing homes, or I should say COVID positivity was already in the nursing homes. So the idea that the advisory which was actually issued under pressure from the Greater New York Asso Hospital Association who wanted to free up their beds. But the idea that COVID positivity wasn't in nursing homes already, I think is uh, unsubstantiated by the actual timelines, timeline of events. Something else that people also don't realize are two, two things, actually one I don't have on here, but the Fire Department of New York was asked to kind of, or ordered basically to stand down from responding to medical emergency calls. Now there was still EMS, emergency medical uh, uh, services, but the fire department was um, told that they couldn't respond to some of these, I guess like minor, they were trying to keep them or ostensibly trying to keep them from answering minor calls because they had an influx in calls with, with people kind of panicking. I think I mentioned that last time and showed you the data for that where people were starting to freak out um, after the, the first case was announced. But another thing that happened is that EMS was uh, told or guidance was issued that told EMS serv services not to transport cardiac arrest patients to hospitals. So like if you arrive and the person doesn't have a pulse, you shouldn't try to save them and you shouldn't if, if you or and or if you have some reasonable attempts, you should not transport that person to the hospital because you might spread the virus and you might bring the virus. If the, the, the assumption was that that person might have the virus, right? And that that's what was causing the cardiac arrest. And so you don't want to bring them in the hospitals because the hospitals are overwhelmed. The hospitals were not overwhelmed or they weren't overrun with patients anyway, we know from, from the data. But that order was, was issued. It was revoked in late, late April, and the nursing home advisory was rescinded in May, early May. But it's interesting to look at these orders around where people died. Um, that's Matilda's law. Again, not, not a law, but it was basically, hey, old people, stay home. It was named after Cuomo's uh, mother and issued as an, you know, an act of caring right? So it made it seem like a good thing. But telling elderly people in New York City to stay home um, is, is I, I would say that that increases the risk of mortality right, right away, especially if you've ever been in New York City apartment. They are not big, <laughs> right? And for most New Yorkers, their, their life is, and this is true in a lot of big cities, your, your life is outside, of your apartment, or you go to your deli, you go and play checkers in Central Park, you have your have your connections that you make. So sitting at sitting at home by yourself or even with others, watching the TV, I mean, this this is all a, a recipe for for disaster. This is just one of the articles on that um, EMT that that order to the EMTs. How did this play out in some of the other data? Is it co corroborated these deaths at home? Well, when I look at ambulance dispatches arriving to hospitals in this period, we see a pretty dramatic decline. I have questions about the decline from this period in 2017 to 2018 too, but that's maybe for another time. But look at the corresponding dramatic increase in patient pronounced dead at the scene. It makes sense given the death at home data. If we look a little more granule at ambulance dispatches arriving to hospital, so this is the, the daily view. This is one of those data points where if I was talking to somebody who could, you know, actually do something about this, like some kind of official or congressperson, I'd be like, I, I, have, I have some concerns about what's going on, what was going on here. We see on the fourth of each month, starting in January, we see a spike in the number of people arriving, being taken to hospitals. 
I find that pretty curious. Then we, we see a drop after the first, we see a spike, then a drop when the first case is announced. Then we see a pretty concentrated uh, stream of arrivals, but only for 11 days, and then a drop. And then we see all the, oh, look, the fourth, April 4th. Oh, look again, the, the fourth. What do I think is going on here? Could it be that there's like data backlog and then they stuck it on the fourth of every month, I guess, right? So there could be, it could be a data of a fluke. But I also wonder about whether this was long-term care facility residents being taken at certain times to the hospital. That would, pro that would be my first my first guess is data anomaly. The second, the second one is that there's a there's like a scheduled transport of people from particular places. Again, I find that really curious. If we look at a longer timeline, those spikes happen until early, until until the vaccine basically is is rolled out, right? And then it normalizes again. So I would like the New York City, uh, you know, Department of, of Health and e EMT to maybe answer some questions about this. I'm gonna. I actually just looked at this this week, so I'm gonna email them and ask. But what you know, what is what is going on there, or what is not going on there? I, I find that that interesting. Doctors at the time were reporting that people were not showing up to the hospital. You know, where's, where's our heart attack patients? People were afraid. I mean, just, just fear. People did show up at the hospital or tend to show up at the hospital if they had something that seemed like it could be the virus, right? Something res respiratory. But everything else or many other things, people were not brought. However, with the EMS order or gui guidance, you know, were people really afraid or they were just getting anxious or, you know, what somebody has a heart attack, but then they're not saved. Right. So I, you know, I, I think, I think both were, both were at, at play. If we look at those deaths by home, they were primarily, um, or a, a good portion, I shouldn't say primarily, but like a huge number is, is heart related, a huge number. Then we have a suspiciously high number that are that attribute underlying cause to COVID-19. Other respiratory, there is a little bit of an increase in other respiratory deaths at, at home, but but not not much. And then we see some cancer deaths at, at home. You know that that could be people that just ended up dying. They were already dying of of cancer, and they you know, chose to die at home or they came home from the hospital or that. So there's a lot of, of obviously sudden spread of cancer does not, does not occur. Um, but that's what the causes looks like. With those COVID deaths at home or the ones that were attributed, even though it's not an outsized portion of the excess in this period, it's very strange that uh, almost half, I mean, I guess it's just under half, like 40% of all deaths attributed to COVID-19 that occurred at the decedent's home were in one city. I find that pretty, pretty crazy. Going back for a second to the nursing home policy, I do not have this data by time series. New York State says that I have to submit a research request to get it, which you know I, may, I, might, I might do, but there was a massive drop in the discharges from hospital inpatient to skilled nursing facilities. So, you know, a, a lot a lot of this leads me to conclude that we had a lot of nursing home residents dying in the hospitals and that true number is not being disclosed. State data say at least 2000 in the period were nursing home residents, but that's the ones that they say were COVID. We don't have an, a number an all-cause number of nursing home residents sent into hospitals who never left. But the data suggest that there were a good chunk of those, of those people. 
The overwhelmed hospital narrative is a bunch of malarkey, according to the data. Overrun, I should say. Patient volumes were not were not high. The purported epi epicenter, Elmhurst Hospital, that got a lot of atten attention. They did not see hot, like their highest ever vol volumes. That just that 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 didn't didn't happen. If we look more on the daily level, and this is uh, you know, data that I obtained via FOIL, it's not just out there. Um, although this should be out there, right? All this data should be should be public. I shouldn't have to ask for it. But it's fascinating to look at the ICU and non-ICU beds um, and alongside some other things that, that were done. The canceling of elective surgeries, I think, has been minimized as a factor in people's people's death. People think, oh, well, you know, breast augmentation was was canceled. And that's that's not the case. I just heard from a woman yesterday who said that uh, her friend, I don't think it was her husband, it was a, a friend who had been in New York City Hospital, was scheduled for an elective surgery. She didn't say what. It was canceled. And he died in the hospital two days later. So I really wonder about that drop in the non-ICU bed occupancy and the ICU bed. I wonder about deaths in that like pre-lockdown and in those pre-lockdown days. That's pretty interesting. And this is one of the potential fraud signals for me. I wonder if those deaths were moved forward, like they were post dated. Um, that, that would be pretty easy to do. It would be, it would be pretty easy to, to, to do. Uh, I just I just showed that. The other reason that I say that is because when I look at this occupancy data for Elmhurst, and again, this is one hospital, it's a public hospital. And then I take a look at, this is the other graph, that black line, that's from CDC Wonder. So that's hospital inpatient all cause. And then the red line of the COVID deaths is, I actually got that from the supplemental data in a study that was published in 2021 on ventilator use in the public hospitals. There are 11 public hospitals, Elmhurst is one. And they reported the COVID deaths and the COVID deaths reported in that study for the 11 hospitals, that curve like pre predates, right? It comes before the all cause inpatient mortality curve. I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. It's almost like they're saying, or they're alleging that some kind of event occurred in early March. So I want to look more into that. That's something that I just discovered recently. And I have a lot of questions about. Justin Hart, who some of you might know, he heads up Rational Ground, but early on in May, 2020, he made a really, really good observation. I tweeted about this this week that uh, we had, and Mark, Martin Neal looked at this and called it a pinpoint pandemic. I think that's a really good way of, of, of putting it. Um, we, we see basically um, a really high number of the you know, reported COVID. This was deaths being reported as COVID at the time, which would have been primarily hospital deaths, right? But we see them very concentrated in just a few areas, Detroit, Chicago, uh, downstate Illinois there, that's East St. Louis, or that's where East St. Louis is in Illinois. Um, and then we have the tri-state area, we have Pittsburgh, and we have, we have upstate New, New York. So I think that's pretty fascinating. What is this what we would expect from spread, a spreading, a spreading virus? I, 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 I would not. But what are some of these areas on here? And actually, New, I'm surprised he doesn't have New Orleans. New Orleans had its had its uh, rise and peak early. Actually, they peaked they peaked and fell earlier than New York, which is interesting, right? But what do some of these areas have in common? Well, I, I put it this way on Twitter: like lots of public housing. We've got a lot of residents who receive or rely on government aid. Got a lot of elderly living alone in smaller spaces, lots of nursing homes, some population groups with health issues. And I, I say that not because more vulnerable to COVID, 
but just more vulnerable to disruption, right? Especially in an urban area. And with the exception of New Orleans, those other areas have colder climate in late winter, right? So I think that's quote ideal in this situation because those people are more likely to like not go out, stay home, right? If, if you live in Hawaii, a shutdown order or a, a, a lockdown order is, is very different. It has a very different impact on your lifestyle than it does in a New York. And I think that that's something that people don't really think about or can consider.